Yep. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another virtual dental shouting session. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sweeney, who is a general dentist, and the floor is yours. Hi, guys. My name is um, Dr. Renee Sweeney. Thank you for that introduction, Chris. So I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. So I'm going to share a little bit about my journey to becoming a dentist, where I'm at now, and hopefully be able to answer some questions that you guys may have about the application process, dental school, or life after dental school. So let's jump in. Okay, so my story, I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Um, I moved to Pittsburgh for both college and dental school. Then I am currently in Miami, Florida, where I am a practicing dentist. I graduated in 2019, so I've been here for almost three years now. Fun fact that my fiance is also a dentist. And uh, one of my favorite organizations that you'll see on the lower right is Caring for Miami, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work with them. They are a nonprofit organization in Southern Florida where we provide mobile dental services to people all throughout the community um, that don't have access to dental care, who don't have dental insurance um, and are oftentimes below the poverty line. <clears throat> so that's a unique thing that I get to um, to get, take part in. And like I said, most of my training was done in Pittsburgh. So the city of Pittsburgh is near and dear to my heart and I'm currently in Miami, Florida. So I'll get into a little bit more about that. So what made me a competitive applicant? I always tell people that I truly believe that getting into dental school is a game. Um, I will say that I feel like I know people who were smarter than me, who got less interviews or didn't get into dental school and people who maybe were less competitive than me on paper, but had more interviews, got accepted to more dental schools than I do. So it, you really just never know. All you can do is put yourself out there, give it your all, um, try your best and you know, try to make yourself as competitive as you can. But if it's truly your passion and it doesn't happen on the first try or even the second try, you know, just keep after it. It really will happen for you if it's something that you want to do and really have a passion for. So for me, I had different leadership both in and out of um, college. So oftentimes I think people think of leadership as having to be, you know, a president or on the executive board of your club at school. That's not always the case. You know, you can have leadership within a part-time job in your community, in your church, um, you know, at volunteering things. It can, that can look so different. They just want to know that you are able to lead people in some capacity. So don't always think that you have to be a leader of a club at your school if that's not either feasible or not something you're interested in, but that can look different for everybody. Um, weekly volunteering. So I was always kind of consistently volunteering with a few different organizations that I was really passionate about, none of which actually had to do with dentistry at all. So a lot of people have a misconception that everything on your application has to do with dentistry in order for you to get in. And that's not true. To be honest, most, I think, administration wants to see something different sometimes um, on your resume because they know you're applying. They know you want to help people. They know that you are interested in dentistry, but things that you have that are going to set you apart from the person next to you is what's really important. So those are things that really try and hone in on when you are both applying, when you're going for your interview, even for jobs, anything in life is thinking about really what sets you apart from the person next to you. What can you say, or what do you have that the person next to you might not, because at the end of the day, all of us were interested in dentistry. All of us were trying to go to dental school. All of us wanted to help people in some capacity. So whatever you can have to put on there that sets you apart is going to be something that you can talk about and that they can rem remember you by because you want to be memorable. Um, research, to my understanding, it's not required. Um, some schools may require, but across the board, it's not required. So the schools that I was specifically applying to were either requiring it or was highly recommended. I can't really remember at the time, um, but I was not super interested in, you know, a lot of lab experience or what you would typically think about with research. So I actually did a lot of um, participant or um, like client-based research. So I worked with a nutrition lab where we worked on like weight management, um, polycystic ovary syndrome studies um, and work side by side with participants, as well as um, a DNA and um, oral salivary um, testing research where we collected samples straight from patients in the dental school. Um, so again, I wanted to do more person to person or something that I actually found interesting, because if you are going to do research, 
try and contact a professor or get involved with a lab that you are going to be interested in because it is a lot of time to spend there if it's not something that you like at all. So I know a lot of my colleagues now who um, in dental or prior, sorry, prior to dental school as they were applying, didn't do research at all. So it's not necessarily something that you have to do. Um, even my fiance, who is a dentist, I was actually asking him when I was putting this together, what he had on his application and his application was vastly different than mine. Um, he had a lot of like projects that he was doing business projects. Um, he didn't do any research. He talked about some of the patents for things that he applied for. Um, because he was very entrepreneurial minded. So just keep that in mind that it does not have to be what you might think of or what the quote unquote traditional application can look like. Um, I always worked part-time. So I talked about the work that I did as a fitness instructor. I did a lot, a lot of shadowing, especially with general dentists. Um, that is something that dental schools want us to try and see. I know with it still being kind of COVID era, it's a little bit harder to get hours, but I would recommend, even if you don't know anyone in dentistry, just cold calling offices, because you would be surprised at how many places actually really are willing to have dental students come in, even at this point now, um, to let you into shadow, to talk to them, to see different things. So really try and do that. And then something that I had that was a little more unique was I was on um, the dance team. So I was able to talk about, you know, my experience with that, with Pittsburgh, um, why I love the city and different things that I really enjoyed um, doing. So to sum kind of all that up is I had a lot of experience with my community, with my church, um, in nutrition settings. I did, um, work with the soup kitchens, work with, um, some hospital volunteering. Um, and yeah, so I didn't have a lot of per se things on my application that were just dentistry related aside from shadowing. I'm just trying to see my notes here if I have anything else. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to, I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing anything. No worries. Here. Okay. Typical day as a dentist. So it can really vary day to day. Um, what your day might look like for me. Um, I have a lot of emergencies. Um, so a lot of people that might be coming in from pain, something that they broke, something that they chipped, um, they want fixed. So it can be a lot of procedures that could be cosmetic related, what we call restorative, meaning like fillings, crowns, things like that, um, extractions or oral surgery, um, endodontics or root canals. Um, as a general dentist, you can do orthodontics or Invisalign. Like you have a very, very wide scope of what you can do as a general dentist. It just depends on your skill set, what you like to do, um, and what you want your practice or your day-to-day -to, -day to look like. So, um, for me, I wanted my dates to vary. Um, I enjoy having different procedures throughout the day. So I'm not doing the same thing all day long. Um, but if you're someone who does like doing the same thing all day long, you can tailor your practice, especially if you're in your own private practice to be whatever you want it to be. So I know some dentists who really only do orthodontics, crowns, veneers, um, some people who only really do like oral surgery, some people who only do mainly pediatric dentistry. So you can really tailor it to what you like. If there's things you like, if there's things you don't, or if you truly enjoy all of it, you can keep that wide scope, which is awesome. Um, it, I think one of the questions asked, like, what is the most difficult part um, of being a dentist? And I would say that it's management of both your office um, and your staff, which is something they don't really teach you in dental school. Um, so there's a lot of on the job or on the spot training with that. Um, but that goes that's something that you are able to work on in any environment, even now, is learning how to manage people as a leader. Um, because at the end of the day, you're going to come out of dental school knowing how to do dentistry, but they're not going to necessarily teach you the business side of it or how to be a leader. So that's something that you can work on, you know, on your own. Um, and someone who's able to lead a team well will be very successful. Um, same thing with patient management. You'll know we know how to do the dentistry side of it, um, but there's a lot of psychology and just you know, um, empathy that goes into being a dentist, because at the end of the day, so many people don't, unfortunately don't like coming in to see the dentist. So it's kind of our job to be able to get on that level, to connect with them, for them to trust us, for us to find that connection that they feel comfortable because we're not just treating a tooth or a mouth. We're treating an entire person. They come with a story. So I think that can often be 
some of the greatest part of dentistry, but can sometimes be some of the most difficult part of dentistry because it's different from person to person, both with your staff and with your patients on what someone needs from you, how to connect with them, how to manage them, um, things like that. So it's just, that's what makes every single day a little bit different and um, fun for sure. into some of these cases. So this is a before and after of a patient that I had who was actually a singer. You'll notice that this picture on the left-hand side, it looks like some of her teeth are dropping down. And that was actually because she had what's considered periodontal disease or advanced gum disease, meaning that a lot of her teeth were very, very loose because she had such infected tissue and bone around it that the bone had resorbed away due to that bacteria. So her teeth were actually very loose. Um, what you see on the bottom, those dark areas, those were two existing implants she already had. So we did what's called um, an all in four fixed prosthesis, meaning that all of her top teeth were removed um, due to infection, cavities, just inability to support um, a prosthesis. And she wanted something that would be fixed into place. And then the bottom, we utilized her existing implants to do what's called an implant bridge, meaning that you use an implant on either side and a porcelain piece, three unit piece in the middle to anchor in place. So you'll see on the right, this was her after. Um, so, so just some things about her specific case is her main concerns were that she wanted it to be functional. She's a singer. So doing any type of prosthesis on someone who's a singer can be difficult because they have to be able to sing well and have it not impede anything they're doing. So that automatically took something removable out of the question because she couldn't risk having it move around, having it float around um, while she's singing. And then financial, you know, it's, she knew that it was going to be a, um, a big investment, but she really wanted something that would last her hopefully um, the rest of her life and that she would, would look natural. She would be able to function well with. Um, so those were some of her main concerns. Fortunately, she didn't have a ton of um, health concerns, but she did have periodontal disease and was diabetic. So the reason that that's concerning specifically in her case is when someone has implants, age does not rule them out. So if you have very great bone, you're super healthy. Um, you could be 95, hundred years old and still be a candidate for those type of cases. But what does get concerning for patients, especially when it comes to implants is periodontal disease and diabetes, diabetes, actually the same bacteria that cause periodontal disease or advanced gum disease can play off or affect diabetes. So if someone is uncontrolled with their diabetes or their periodontal disease, their ability to heal um, is very, very compromised, meaning that when, when someone has teeth taken out, um, their ability for their bone and gum tissue to heal up well and be healthy is compromised. So it can take a lot longer. And then if someone has periodontal disease, like I was talking about, they start losing bone around their teeth because it's not healthy bacteria eat it away. So while implants cannot get cavities, they can get periodontal disease. It's called peri-implantitis. So that means that they lose the bone around the implants in the same way that they did around their teeth. So that's always a concern that if someone is not stable, these cases can still fail. Um, so it's always important to educate your patients that just because they don't have teeth anymore in there um, or their own teeth anymore, keeping everything clean is super important. They honestly have to take care of these prostheses better than they would their own natural teeth. Um, so just really educating them on that. Like I said, the aesthetics and phonetics, which are phonetics are just their ability to speak well. Um, so that, that those were some of the difficult um, parts of our case, but we delivered this, I believe like a year and a half ago now. Um, so I see her or my hygienist sees her every three months for her cleaning. She's doing great. Everything's really stable. Um, she was very, very excited about this. So just to kind of go back. So that was her before that was her after getting into the next case. So this is a little bit different. So this is a patient that one of the unique things that you have, especially when you're out practicing, um, is people who stay with the office. Um, you get to see how things progress. Usually you're hoping it's for the better. Um, but in this case it was for the worst. I saw a patient two years prior, um, had not returned to the office, did not get anything, um, done at the time. I think he may have gotten like one tooth taken out. Um, but as you can see, so what I outlined in red is 
it's hard to see in that first image, but that was where the cavity was at the initial point in time. Um, so at the, at that time with the size of the cavity, it was still very, very large. You can see it a little bit clearer in that panoramic image on the top left, um, that big dark area. We had discussed potentially doing a root canal there, possibly a bridge, you know, some partials on top, taking out some of his other broken teeth that he had, but he still had teeth that were, um, in decent shape that we could work with at that point. Now, when he came back two years later, you'll notice that that big dark area is much, much, much bigger. There's not much tooth left in what circle at the bottom is a large abscess or infection at the base of that tooth. So that was, you know, a moment where we could go back and show the patient, like, look how much this has progressed in two years by not doing anything. And this is only going to keep getting worse because unfortunately you now have a bunch of teeth. Again, it's hard to see in this top image, um, but had a bunch of teeth that had abscesses and infections that were loose now. Um, so what we could have done two years prior was different than what we could do now in this patient. Also just to complicate things more for him, he had type two diabetes, hypertension, anemia, chronic kidney disease, um, pretty much all of which were uncontrolled. He's immunosuppressed. Um, and one of our biggest concerns with him is his ability to clot or his risk of bleeding due to his kidney disease um, and some other things. So because of this patient's, you know, this patient's not only sick in terms of their overall health, but also in terms of their dental health, which again, plays off each other, um, compromises the situations a lot more. So now where we, like I said, could have done um, something that may have been upper and lower removable partials, we're now talking about taking, you know, his remaining teeth out. Um, most of those bottom teeth, honestly, at this point. Um, so it becomes more expensive, more extensive treatment plan um, by leaving things, by not having things addressed. And this is, again, where it's our job to really educate patients. Um, we want to be empathetic to, you know, where they're at, so their, maybe their financial situation, what they're going through, but just educating them just from their health standpoint that, listen, if we don't, if we don't take care of all these infections that are in your mouth, you know, this can get you more and more sick. Um, you know, this can, only, this can worsen your diabetes. This can worsen your kidney disease. You know, everything that's going on is all playing off each other and that we we're here to help you get to that healthy point. We want to see you get back on track. We want you to be able to eat well. Um, so yeah, so we had this in that, that now we were talking to the patient about potentially seeing the oral surgeon, um, to have everything taken out, to have immediate dentures put in place. It can be done by, you know, by me, um, as the general doctor as well. Um, but we do have an oral surgeon in our office that it's oftentimes a little bit easier to utilize in a case like this, um, just for time, time's sake, um, and specific patient, his bone is very dense. So, um, all that is to say that by leaving things untreated, you know, we're now seeing it progress. We're now seeing the more extensive treatment plan um, that we have to talk to the patient about and how things have changed. I think I have one more case on here. Okay. So this patient is a little bit more aesthetic related, but her main concern was that she had a very, very large cavity on, um, in the left image, it's her right side, this front, um, right tooth has a very, very large cavity. Um, her other concern was she had some other smaller cavities, but the aesthetics of her teeth as well, um, because we discussed doing um, a crown, some other um, fillings, but her concern was also aesthetic. So instead we did some anterior crowns on the front to not only correct the aesthetics, but also to, to treat um, the cavities and disease that she had going on in her mouth. So this was the day of insertion. So the gums are definitely irritated in this picture, um, but the patient was very happy with the aesthetics. We were able to treat the disease aspect and kind of handle two things um, at once. She had some other things going on um, in terms of her bite and different things that we addressed, but we were able to kind of tackle a few different things in one for her in this case. Um, so one thing I did want to address, which if you notice in this, it looks like when she's biting in place that the, her front teeth don't really fully come together. So we had initially discussed going through um, orthodontics, like braces, Invisalign um, to help treat some of that. The patient was not interested in orthodontics in any capacity, which is why we went the route of doing crowns in some of these teeth is because we had to move the teeth more um, than we would with just something like a veneer into place. So um, th those are different things that come into play when 
aesthetics are at play and someone has teeth that aren't perfectly aligned is you have to take away more to structure in order to put things into a better place. Um, so again, just ed educating patient on different options that are available, what we can do for them. Um, and at the end of the day, they're ultimately able to make whatever choice that they want, you know, with our guidance and, you know, with what, what we're comfortable with um, doing. Okay. So the hardest thing about being a dentist, um, I actually hadn't seen this quote until I was looking at it. So it's by Kate Moss, which if anyone doesn't know, she is a supermodel or was a supermodel. Um, it says, I hate dentists. That's why my tooth fell out. I was in the middle of a root canal and wouldn't go back. So it just dropped out when I was in the middle of Fifth Avenue. I had to do the Calvin Klein show without the tooth. So it's just interesting because, you know, reading this, you can obviously tell her dislike for the dentist. You know, it's it seems very much so that she's kind of um, blaming the dentist in a way for things. So this is just something that a lot of patients have that mindset that they don't enjoy coming to the dentist. So that's why I say that we have to remember that we are treating a person, an entire person who comes with a story, not just a tooth, not just a mouth. Um, so you know, when you're treating someone, all of that comes into play because you have to have a good bedside manner. You have to have empathy for your patients being able to connect and relate to them so that they feel comfortable with you. Because at the end of the day, they don't, patients don't necessarily care unless something hurts or looks good. Aside from that, they don't necessarily know the dentistry that you're doing. So you could be the best clinical dentist in the entire world, but if you're not able to connect well with your patients, it doesn't matter. They're not, you're not going to have patients that want to come see you. So you have to be able to connect with them, relate to them, talk to them, make them feel comfortable. Um, so that they, you know, they want to have treatment done with you. Um, they can trust you. They feel good about what you're doing. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a interesting quote. All right. So any questions that you guys have, sorry, I know I'm a fast talker, so <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs> and uh, we have questions here uh, collected from the Instagram. The first question is, did a degree in nutrition and dietetics help you for any aspect in the interview? So, yes, I, I would say that it helped me in the interview. It's also helped me in life as a dentist now as well. So one of the things that I think oftentimes people don't realize um, or might get afraid by is that science majors will always help you, um, complete your requirements. I think oftentimes like bio majors, chem majors are very popular. Um, but I always tell people if it's not what you're passionate about or what you like, choose a different major. Um, so having a different major, not only gives you something else different to talk about that you might be more memorable than the person in front and behind you who if they're both bio majors and there's nothing wrong with being a bio major. It's just most people tend to be a bio major for medical or dental school. Um, but having something that's different can set you apart. And it also, what I loved about nutrition specifically is that it has a huge connection, um, that anything you put in your mouth affects the entire rest of your body affects your teeth. So I love that because I'm very passionate about it. And it's something that I can talk to my patients now about as well, but it, I do believe believe it helped me a little bit in my interview to set me apart a little bit because I, I think there, there may have been one other person, um, at the time who was in my dental class, who was a nutrition major. But like I said, most people were bio majors. Um, so having overall in general, having a different major can set you apart. So I had some people in my class who were business majors, who were English majors, you know, we're all across the map. And again, you might have some more, requirements to take that but if it's something that you really enjoy i would say do it for sure but does um does not taking the bio major make it harder in dental school to pass the exams i wouldn't say that it makes it harder because i think for you at the end of the day you still have to be passionate about dentistry in general but say you're someone that you're passionate about dentistry but you love writing or you love business you know having all of those things in play can still be transferable skills and still be things that help. It might be more difficult in the sense that you may have to take more classes. So your schedule might be more overloaded applying to dental school. Um, but again, if it, if dentistry is still what you're passionate about and you still like the sciences, you know, it's, 
your major is not going to make it harder for you in dental school. Um, you, cause you're still going to have to same, take the same prerequisites that everybody has to take. You just also have all of your classes that apply to your major. So it's, it just comes down to you as a person. Yeah, sure. I agree on that. And what is the best thing about dentistry and what changes you want to see in this profession? The best thing about dentistry. I mean, there's a lot of things that are great. Um, I mean, our, the work-life balance that you can have, everyone might not have it, but that you can have as a dentist, especially if you have your own practice is phenomenal. Um, you know, you're not ever on call. You, you know, really get to form connections with your patients. Um, so if you like talking to people, if you're a people person, there's a lot of that. Um, like I said, you have a huge variety in your day and you get to tailor your practice to whatever you want that to look like if you have your own practice. Now, if you're working for someone else, that may not be the case. You will always still have autonomy over what procedures you do, but you may not have um, full autonomy with what your practice looks like. But that's one of, the, I think, the best things about dentistry is that you have a lot of flexibility, um, both in terms of your schedule, in terms of what your day looks like, and also just your ability to kind of live your life. It's a great um, launching pad into other things as well. In terms of what I would like to see changed in the industry, um, I guess just, I'm not more change that I want to see, but I'm excited to see for what changes come in terms of the technology, because um, I believe that we're at a point where we've had technological changes, but we're kind of more in, I'll call it a waiting period, I guess, where we haven't had massive changes recently. And I think that that is going to be coming, that I think there's going to be a lot of changes in the next um, 10 plus years within dentistry in terms of technology and how it's going to kind of shift um, the field of it. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, you have a dental clinic of your own. So at the moment, I do not. I am actually working for a different office right now, but I may or may not have something eventually in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. That would be nice. That would be nice. Uh, yeah. What's the best thing that you will say you experienced as a dental student at University of Pittsburgh? The, you said the best thing that I experienced? Was that the question? Uh, yeah, the best thing you experienced in your dental school. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I loved specifically about the University of Pittsburgh, there, there was a lot, and I, I genuinely love Pittsburgh as a city. There's a lot of things that are great about it. But what I, one thing I loved about our dental school that, that was a little bit unique is we had a special needs clinic. Um, I always loved working with special needs patients. I worked with them um, prior to dental school. I was a dance instructor for, um, for adults and kids with um mental and physical um, disabilities. So we had a clinic in our school specifically for special needs patients, which some schools have, but they're oftentimes operated by faculty where ours was completely student run. And we also had um, an anesthesia department. So we actually got to run all of those cases ourselves, which was really unique because most people don't get that ability in dental school to not only work with special needs patients, but also get to work with sedation cases, and that population as well. So um, I learned a lot, a lot, a lot um, in that clinic and I really, really enjoyed it. That's amazing. And how is the patient pool? How does the patient pool look like in general? So I would say from my understanding, I, I mean, obviously I can only speak to Pittsburgh, but having friends who went to other schools, I will say that the size of the city that you are in um, definitely plays a role into what you're patient population is going to look like at your school. So, I mean, we had a, a pretty decent patient population or patient flow. Um, I know compared to some other cities or some other schools, it was definitely like lower because, you know, we're not in New York city. We're not as big as, you know, Boston, Chicago, a lot of those areas. Um, and then I know some schools that may be like rural or they may be the only school in like their state or for a wide range, they may have a bigger patient flow, but I didn't struggle to get my requirements, but I will also say that I think in any dental school, it's kind of what you make it. So most schools are not going to like hand serve you everything on a platter. Like you have to still work for stuff. Um, now I didn't have to go out and find my own patients. I know some schools that is the case, or you do kind of have to fight for some of those patients. That was not the case at our school, but I will say that if you put out more of an effort to really work with some faculty on things or get certain patients, 
like you would get things more so than others. So if you put more work in than somebody else, you're going to get more cases than somebody else. Um, but you also didn't have to, you weren't like on your own trying to figure that out. So, but I think that goes for any schools. Like if you're willing to work very hard and take everything you can out of it, you'll be, you'll do very well no matter what school you're at. Yeah, I agree on that. Um, did you join any clubs that were, or were involved in any clubs during dental school? Yes, I was a part of the special needs club. Um, I'm trying to think. I was a part of like the ASDA, which is like the Dental Student Association. Um, and then I also led and went on a few mission trips while I was in dental school. I think there may have been a few other ones that I was like in, but those were the ones that I was heavily active in. Um, so I actually went on and led um, a mission trip to Jamaica. Um, which was really awesome, both in my second and third year of dental school. So got a lot of extra experience there um, with a like with a patient population that was very unique. Um, and, you know, working on a mission trip doing dentistry. Um, it's something that I'm still very passionate about. I do, you know, the mission work on a local level here now, as well as, you know, when COVID regulations and things died down, that's something I plan to pick back up is some international uh, mission trips as well. But that was one thing I loved, would highly recommend it if your school offers that. Um, to definitely take advantage of it on even a local level. So if your schools, most of them will typically get involved with a mission of mercy or local um, clinic and program like once a year, but also if they are doing international trips, I highly suggest getting involved in that if you have the chance to. Um, would you kindly tell us more about the, the volunteering trip? Like how did you organize it and did you go with faculty or just yeah. um, a little so, bit more details? Um, Yeah. So there was a few different ones. There were three total at our school. Um, the one that I was specifically involved in, um, me and, uh, my, um, co-president at the time of the club, we were pretty much responsible for everything. So we ha did have two faculty that came with us. Um, one was a faculty at the school. One was, um, just previously had been a part of the trip and his daughter had went to the dental school. So, um, both of them had been doing it for a handful of years. Um, but we, organize everything like as the students like we him and I organize everything from picking our team to bringing all the instruments to booking the flights booking the places like organizing everything um so it was definitely like a big task um at least with our program I know one of the other ones it was basically done by the faculty and program for them so they kind of just booked the trip and went um but I was super like glad it was something that I got to experience because Again, I was leading an entire team, organizing an entire um, event. So it was really neat. I enjoyed it. I know it could look different at every program and every school that you're at, um, but the experience behind it is what is really cool. Um, you really get to help a community um, in need. And I think more than anything, you get a lot out of it um, as a student, you know, going in especially if you're going in with the right intentions on it, um, is you really get to connect with the people in a community there um, on a way that you don't really always have the capacity to do that. So it's a really cool experience. Um, and oftentimes you're going at a different point on a break. So you are sacrificing, you know, maybe a portion of your break, depending on what that looks like at your school. Um, but you're gaining experience. Like I said, you're gaining a memory that you'll probably never forget. Um, and likely making connections in some capacity that, you know, is just kind of priceless. And how many people joined? How many people went there? Um, so the trip that I was on, we only had a team of 14 people total, mm -hmm. but one of the other clubs, I want to say there was like 35 of them. So again, it can look vastly different. It's just going to really depend on your club, your school, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, why do you like general dentistry? Are you considering to go into any specialty? So I was considering um prosthodontics which is basically crowns bridge dentures implants but like sp specifically um specializing in just that um the reason that I didn't is actually after talking to a lot of people um a lot of prosthodontists coming out tend to do what a general dentist does for a handful of years because it's a specialty that is I don't want to say is being overrun by general dentists, but is not as widely utilized as it was years ago. Um, so they have kind of a unique skill set in 
being able to do very complex cases of full mouth rehabilitation with, you know, like I said, crowns, bridges, dentures, implants. Um, and they're very, very skilled in it for sure. Um, but I've also kind of learned in the process that I liked the variety in my day. I liked being able to still do, you know, extractions, root canals, if I wanted to do some other things and realize that there's a lot of continuing education out there that if I want to, you know, um, be more highly trained in certain aspects that I have the ability to do, to do that and to get more training in that specific area. So for me, um, that was the one that I thought most highly in. I also really liked extractions, but I knew for me, oral surgery is a very hard to get into, but also is another four to six years after dental school. And for me, I just was not really, um, I was kind of done <laughs> with school after dental school. Like I said, at least for me, I decided if I wanted to specialize and go back, I would at another point in time. But for me, de general dentistry was like the best fit in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. And I think prosthodontic takes another four years or three. I'm not sure. Say that again? I think prosthodontic takes another four years, right? It's two to three usually. Oh, two to three years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of dedication. Yes, exactly. So it it's a lot of education and then it's also another, you know, financial investment mm -hmm. for sure. So yeah. just, just different things to think about, you know. Mm -hmm. So what's the most competitive specialty aside from uh, oral surgery? I would say, uh, I would say oral surgery and um, ortho are the two most ortho. competitive for sure. So those are two that if you, if you know for sure that you want to get in, go into, or you're pretty sure that you want to go into, because we're kind of talking about this, that. Dental school is very unique. If you're someone that you know for sure that you want to specialize, be very cognizant of, you know, your grades and how you're doing. Not to say that, oh, you need to, you know, have an, like an A or a hundred in every single class, but mm -hmm. you definitely need to, you know, be more cognizant of your grades versus if you're mm -hmm. someone who maybe you either just want to apply to like a general practice residency, or you're thinking you don't want to specialize at all and just want to go work, um, which is totally fine. Then yes, you, you know, I'm sure you still want to do well and, you yeah. know, retain all your information for sure, but you don't have to be as stressed out about your um, mm -hmm. grades, but oral surgery and ortho definitely are the two most competitive programs for sure. Got it. Um, how did you manage to fit so many extracurricular activities in your schedule? Back to A lot of it is just yeah. learning. Yeah. It's just learning time management. Um, I mean, it's just, it was the same way for me when I was in college. It's the same way now, even as a dentist, I don't just go to work and come home every day. I'm involved in a lot of other things. So it's just keeping, making priorities, making what you care about priority. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, because at the end of the day in dental school, especially, you know, you go from most of, most of you guys right now in college, I'm sure are involved in a ton of things. So, um, you're going to go from being busy with a ton of things to getting into dental school. And your focus is pretty much going to be all around school now, just because of the sheer workload that you're in. I wouldn't say dental school is any harder, but you're in a very, very high volume of classes. Um, so, you know, most people, their first year, it's going to be a slow roll into, you know, getting involved in other things. Like I said, I always kept, um, a spot for whatever was my priorities, whether it was working out, you know, seeing friends or family, you know, making time for certain things to de-stress because yes, school is your focus in dental school, but you need to still have time for other things. Otherwise you will burn yourself out completely. Um, but as you get the hang of it after, you know, your first, second semester in dental school, you will realize like the, where you have time, you know, where you can hang out a little bit, what you have to be more focused on, what you can, you know, um, stress a little bit less about. So it's just, it's just balancing things. It, it It's, I think that's the hardest thing about dental school, especially first year is, is your transition from college to dental school is that it is, it is a shift for everyone. So, you know, everyone will definitely get to a point where they feel stressed and overwhelmed. Um, and that goes for everyone in your class, the, you know, the number one in your class to the last in your class are going to feel, are going to feel that, but you guys are all in it together. And learning to make friends that you can study with, that you can share that with, um, because keeping that community mindset, I think is super, super important. No matter what school you go to is finding friends that you can study with, finding people that you can share that in those experiences with, because you don't want to go at it alone. I'm telling you, um, it's very difficult. You need community around you. You need that support, um, and people that you can lean on in those times. And I think beside from dental school, you were also a Miss Miami, right? 
Yeah, the South can you, Miami. Can you like talk a little bit about that? That was really yeah, cool. Yeah, so I actually, that's how I met some of um, the people I was closest with when I came um, down to Miami as I competed in uh, Miss Florida USA, so I was Miss South Miami. Um, it was a really fun experience. Um, I was never someone that was involved in pageants ever. Um, one of my friends got involved and I was like, you know what, let's try it out. And had moved to Florida, you know, had the free time, had the ability to do it. And I'm super glad that I did because it really pushed me out of my comfort zone in more ways than one. And I truly think it helped me become a better leader um, and grow more into myself, both personally and professionally. So I'm super glad for that experience. Anything that is like that um, in general, where it's you know, forcing you to really present yourself, um, to be involved in the community, to be a leader, to be a public speaker. Um, I would highly recommend doing it. Even if you feel very uncomfortable about it, anything that's going to push you out of that comfort zone, I think is always a good idea. Um, because you, you never want to stop growing, you know, even now as a dentist, like there's so many things that I still want to do and growth that I, you know, know is out there for me. So Mm -hmm. just never stop pushing yourself. But what was the criteria like? Like, how do they choose if who's going to be? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you submit um, a resume. Um, for the most part, you do an interview. Um, and then there is um, a competition to choose the um, winners. Yep. And then they go on um, to uh, Miss Florida USA, Miss USA from there. So, yep, it's That's a different amazing. competition that you have kind of three different aspects um, that you are judged on. Your interview is very, very heavily um, judged. So they want to know that you're able to communicate and speak with other people, um, that you are well-versed in like what, what's happening in your community, in the state, in the, um, in the U.S., and um, that you're able to uh, speak well in front of others. Mm-hmm. That's very, that's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> and, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And now as a dentist, what does your week look like? That, like the schedule, the work and the break? Yeah, so it's my, right now for me, every week is a little bit different. Um, And since I graduated, it's been different. So I've worked in private practice. I work for a nonprofit and I also um, have worked for a dental service organization or what's considered more like corporate dentistry. Um. And it's been different all the time. So I may work um, some days I may work or some weeks I may work four to five days a week. There's been some where I've worked six days, um, which is definitely a lot. Um, but I would oftentimes get up around, you know, 530 in the morning to work out because I'm someone who likes to work out in the morning. And as of right now, I have to be at my office by um, 745 to start our morning huddle for our office to open at eight. Um, so in order to do that, I had to be getting up pretty early. So I would get up, work out, go to work, um, see patients most days till like 5 PM. And then I would come home. Um, when I wasn't training, I would have different interview sessions, um, different things going on, different meetings. Um, I'm very involved in my church. So I have our small group meets every other week on, um, on Monday and we have our Bible study. Um, or there's just, there's just other, um, community things that I'm involved in. So that can look different, but there's usually, you know, a few days throughout the week that I get home and, you know, can eat dinner, hang out, um, work on some social media things or, um, other things in that aspect that I have a little bit more time to myself, um, and have the ability to do that. But, um, some days when I would be off, I would go and work with, um, the nonprofit organization or when they have a Saturday event, um, in the community, we were seeing um, patients, you know, for maybe five hours or something on a Saturday um, to do that. And then being close to the beach, we I've tried to make a better effort of, you know, going to the beach, seeing that um, at least once a week, because I always thought that living in South Florida, that I would be at the beach all the time. But it's funny because I think I'm more pale than I've ever been in my life um, living in Florida. So I was not outside nearly as much as I wanted to. But um, trying to just get outside, take a walk is to me, that's something that helps me de-stress. Um, so again, just making time for whatever is a priority for you. So my fiance and I, we try to go to dinner like once a week or have like an intentional date night working out for me is also really important. So I try and make time for that, um, every morning if I have the ability to, or at some point in the day, um, you know, seeing family, things like that. So whatever that looks like for you, just trying to make time for those priorities. So would you say being a dentist is easier than being a dental student now? It's just different. I don't know. 
I, I'll say this. I don't know that I would say one is, you know, harder than the other. I would say you could make a, you could make a case for it being harder as a dentist because you just have different responsibilities and troubles. But if I, like, if someone told me I had the option to be in one or two places, I would not go back to dental school. Okay. <laughs> and I don't, not just because it's one of the things you have to do to come out, but it's just a stress that I, I don't miss. There's a lot mm -hmm. of, freedoms that come with being a dentist. So even if there's more stress, for example, managing a team or, um, uh, managing patients, you still have so much more freedom that when I'm done with work for the day, I don't have to go home and study for five hours. You know, yeah. um, that's, that's the beauty of not being in school is the tough thing about dental school, especially once you start clinic. Um, and again, it's, I don't say this to discourage anyone. It's, it's just part of the process. Everyone has to go through it. Um, it's just that, you know, you will oftentimes be in classes and then be seeing patients and then have to come home and study for a handful of hours. You get, don't get me wrong. You get used to it. It's just part of the process and everyone around you is doing it. So it just becomes second nature to you. But when you finish dental school and you're actually working, it's its own type of stress. I remember in the first, you know, month or so being just so exhausted in a different way from seeing patients, even though I felt like I probably had more free time, but it's, like I said, it's a different stress. Um, you no longer have someone watching over you, correcting you on um, taking a look at everything you are, you are on your own. You're making completely your own clinical decisions, but I think it's important to keep a network of people around you that you still feel connected, have people to ask questions to. But so I wouldn't say one is harder than the other. It's just, there's a lot of freedoms that come with finishing school. And, you know, there's a reason that most people are not trying to jump back into, yeah. <laughs> into schools again, they, they enjoy where they're at in their career. So mm -hmm. it's things to look forward to. Uh, uh, is dental school all year round or are there winter or summer breaks? I believe I'm, I can't speak for all dental schools, but I believe from my understanding of all the other schools that all schools are all year round. Um, you may get, I know at our school, we got like a week between, between every semester. Some schools may have like a two week break between some things, but from my understanding, most schools operate off of being, um, you know, all year long, having like a small break between semesters, like a week or so. Um, I know, um, the one school in California, I can't think of the name right now, that's three-year dental school. Theirs may be a little bit different because it's a condensed curriculum, um, but I believe for the most part, it's all year. Mm -hmm. And just two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, where did you get Rafiki? Is that, is that the oh, name? Oh, yes. And what are some yes. interesting uh, facts about him? Yes, I have a two-year-old, um, well, two and a half year old, common marmoset monkey. So he's about this big. Um, he has a very large personality. Um, so he, he's a lot of fun. Um, he actually sleeps with me every single night. Um, nice. some fun facts about him have been, I funny enough, bananas are probably his favorite food. Um, but he eats a very wide diet. He can pretty much have anything that we have cause he is omnivorous. So he eats, you know, fruits, vegetables, um, plain meats, but he has a special um, diet formula that's like specific formulated for him that has everything he needs. Um, so he gets a very wide range in his diet and he actually hates the beach. <laughs> we, <laughs> we've tried to get him to go to the beach or in the water. He is not a fan. He only likes the water if it's a hot bath. He loves taking baths, but does not love the sand or the cold water at the beach. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, I think I think people, the viewers right now watching, should go should go check your Instagram. I think you post about the monkey on your Instagram. Yes, he may have some. If not, I was like, his Instagram is keeping up with Rafiki, which I'm really terrible about posting ever on his uh -huh. stuff. But um, yeah, he's a riot. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> I enjoy him a lot, and he pretty much comes everywhere with us. He before COVID too, like we would take him to dinner with us. Like we took him everywhere. Um, now he, he still comes a lot of places, but now it's a little bit less ju just due to, you know, regulations on things. And, um, but yeah, he's a lot of fun. It's, it's literally like having, um, a little kid, a little furry kid. <laughs> but, but do you like get a lot of attention going out with him? Um, yes. So it depends on if he's just hanging out. So like he has like a little leash that he wears around his waist, mainly just for, his sake because sometimes people will try and like grab yeah. him when we're out um but yeah people are usually just confused because they're not sure if he's like a small dog or what he is because he'll just kind of sit on um my shoulder but yeah he people oftentimes will ask like 
what he is um, or different questions about him just because they're surprised um, Mm -hmm. that not many people have him. Although fun, funny enough, there is another dentist we actually met shortly after being down here that has um, a capuchin monkey. So it's, it's basically what, if you've ever seen the show, like friends or anything, um, or just in any like Hollywood movie, if there was a monkey, it was probably what they were. Um, Rafiki is much, much smaller. He's only about this big, um, wow. but those monkeys are typically about, you know, this big, but he, this dentist that we met, she would bring him to work all the time <laughs> and he would be with her when she was working on patients too. That's so, so if the patients were okay with it. So, yeah, it was funny. And the last question is, how long does it take for you to feel comfortable working as a dentist? So I think a lot of it depends on your confidence and your skill set, you know, procedures that you've done, just uh, mentorship that you've had. Um, I think we were kind of discussing this before we started that. I would say now I, f- I feel pretty comfortable with, you know, most procedures at this point, but most dentists that you'll talk to will say, it takes about five years for you to really feel like comfortable with like anything that is coming at you. But I also think, you know, in your career, that doesn't mean that you'll never have cases that you may, you know, need some other, someone else's input or may need to send to your specialist or may need, you know, to work side by side with your specialist on. Um, because again, every single person is so different. Their needs are so different. Um, and you could see something that, you know, 25 years and you've never seen before. Um, I've, I know I've seen some things that some of my colleagues who have been doing this for 25 plus years hadn't seen before, you know, so it's, you all have different skill sets. Um, but I think usually, you know, your first five years or so is where you do the most learning, um, and get pretty confident in yourself. But again, I, I, I didn't, I ended up choosing not to do a residency and I felt relatively comfortable within my first, you know, few months with, um, treating patients or, or being comfortable enough to, you know, to do most things or know when to reach out to different people on it. And again, I think that comes in your confidence with yourself. And if you are comfortable enough to dive in, know, you know, when to ask questions, know when to refer things out, um, have people that will mentor you and help you along the way. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that would be my biggest recommendation is if you can start finding people, um, that can be mentors to you either in your area or abroad that you can reach out to, um, I think is the, the biggest help that you'll, you'll always utilize no matter where you are in your career. So you basically, uh, after you got out of university, uh, I mean, dental school, you go to work with, you didn't join any other GPA. Yeah, I program. did not do a residency. Yeah. I, so I applied I knew I wanted to be in Miami. Um, so my fiance was moving down here and I wanted to be in the same area as him. So I applied to a few down here and I ended up really not liking the programs that I was looking at. Um, so I ultimately decided not to do, um, a one-year residency. I had some friends who did them and again, their experiences were all across the board. I had some who said it was not worth it at all. And I had some who had like phenomenal, um, experiences gained a lot of experience in different aspects that they were concerned about and helped them to be a lot more comfortable. But that's why I say it it really comes down to your personal experience that you've had in dental school, how clinically competent you feel, um, and your confidence basically in yourself, your skill set, um, and where you're at. So for some people, they are, they do feel confident enough to go out and start working, um, or they have someone, you know, to mentor them and they feel confident in that there's other people I know who, feel they need to do a residency, um, or multiple, you know, it just, like I said, just depends on you. Or for example, there might be some things like when I started, there was some things I wasn't doing as much of as I am now, because I wasn't as confident at the time and got some extra training in some things. Um, or like, and I now will do Botox and fillers with patients where I got a special certification, went to continuing education for that. Um, and it's something I do now. Whereas when I came out, I was not doing that. Um, you know, I hadn't had the training in that yet. So there's just, there's always other continuing education out there that you can go to. If you feel like you want to brush up on things, you want other experience or, um, training in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's all we have for today. And mm-hmm. thank you so much. It was a very informative presentation. So for the few for the viewers, uh, we are gonna post a quiz and it's gonna be expired within twenty four hours. So make sure to do that.